Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are honored to be welcoming back to the show our friend, Mr. Andrew McGuire. Andrew is a director of the Kinesis Monetary System. He is a 40-year veteran of the precious metals markets based in London. Andrew sits on the advisory board of the Allocated Bullion Exchange, and he is one of the world's top experts in trading metals and he serves as an advisor to many international hedge fund managers and bullion banks. He is also a whistleblower. Back in 2009, Andrew publicly and notoriously blew the whistle to the United States regulators over the international fraud and manipulation of gold and silver prices. We are always privileged to have him here on the show. Andrew, how are you today and welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be with you, Michelle, and uh, it's been a while, and it's a blast to be with you. So, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's have some fun here yes. and talk about gold, uh, our favorite subject. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we love having you here. Your life story reads like a James Bond novel. <laughs> really, truly. We have a gold trader trading in an industry of trillions of dollars where everybody knows the prices are being manipulated massive fraud happening and you are the only person to blow the whistle which is extraordinary andrew well and 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 thank you for that but i I think um you know basically i think what is good is that um a lot of the evidence i mean goodness me you're talking about 2009 here 2008 2009 um and a lot of this uh, evidence is now just hitting the news wires now and i think that is good we're seeing actual charges being laid and jailable offenses coming down from but but it blows me away that, that, that after submitting real evidence and, and to, to the regulators that it would take them this long. But we can kind of explore that a bit. But I think um, just so that if people are more interested in, in not just my not my just my story, it's nothing to do with just my story, what it is about the whole gold story, I think there is no better program. It's a one-hour documentary made by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And it's uh, it's on the History Channel. It's called The Secret World of Gold. I think it's all available. It's also available on YouTube, actually. And what it does is provide some really good background, not just to my work as a whistleblower, because it actually, uh, on there, comes on Bart Chilton, a commissioner of the CFTC, talking about this evidence, saying, yeah, we see this evidence. It's, you know, it's a really attesting to the fact. Uh, and also, it also walks through um, uh, I walk people through an example of how billions were made on a silver trade, and we walk the the uh, walk you right through exactly how that happened. And um, on one trade, is that what you're on saying? one single trade on May the first, two thousand and eleven, uh, and it was billions. It was basically what it was. It was a, a six dollar smash of silver. Now you know that each contract, each dollar is 5,000, I mean, each, each contract is 5,000 uh, ounces. So a six, that $6 move smash at one o'clock in the morning um, when China was on holiday, the UK was on holiday. The, the primary, you know, the, 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 where the gold fixes are made where I was on a holiday, only the COMEX was open. And where, who on earth in the right mind would suddenly dump literally that many contracts of silver. And, and we're, I think we're 30,000 30, contracts or something, a, a ludicrous amount of contracts. But anyway, and then suddenly everyone decided exactly where to, to buy it. And, and, and then by the time people woke up in the morning uh, in, uh, around the world, uh, they had been, some cases, been cleaned out of 10 million dollars and the price was only a buck and a half down from where it started and i mean that was the start of a bigger decline but never mind that is one example that we walk through and i think that's why it's really important to have a look just literally go through and see how this is how this is conducted but so really when i started providing this evidence to the u.s regulators uh, it really to expose this market making collusion And and we have to remember, as you say, this is a multi-trillion dollar market. And I don't think people realize that this is a 15 trillion a year gold and silver market. And this is 
maybe just slightly smaller than the euro dollar market. I mean, but second to nothing else. And this is, so really these, these um, manipulations were on a scale larger than the LIBOR scandal. And this market manipulation was being perpetrated by the, uh, the primary uh, market making bullion banks who were involved in setting the daily global, global fixed prices for gold and silver. So really, um, in, by 2010, I thought I'd better get some protection. Uh, through my lawyers, I officially secured protection. A lot of protection. I was just going to say, <laughs> you need well, an army. <laughs> well, I think, I think the th thing is, where, as I was advised, look, if you've got this much information about some of the really, these are some big, really bad actors, and they have potentially billions to lose, uh, what you need to do is get that information quickly too put it out in the public domain, but you can't do that because what would happen is essentially, unless you've got protection under the Dodd-Frank Act, these guys, you know what they can do. These guys can come. I mean, they could kick my door down, take my, 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 my computers, my hard drives, and, and, and then literally uh, I'd have to fight to get them back. I mean, you know, they could pose any kind of question. So really we got this information over to the lawyers. Now, you, you can't, you can't, you can't go after everybody. So once the lawyers had this information and uh, then presented presented it to the CFTC and the DOJ, well, what's the point? You know. So at that point, there, um, you know, as long as I wasn't disclosing anything direct about the evidence, uh, then there's nothing that they could do. So. And this evidence was largely in the form, and what we were doing, providing them information about advanced information of upcoming collusion and price fixing. And that was perpetrated by the market-making bullion banks who, who were privileged to control the global price fix points in go, both gold and silver on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, and I'm on public record, uh, time-stamped by my lawyers providing I think 88, it was over 80, I'm pretty sure it was 88 separate advanced warnings of exactly where the gold and silver prices would fix in the next 24 hours. Now, uh, Michelle, it's like knowing which horse is going to win the next race and clearly a way to profit enormously from such price rigging efforts. And uh, I think, as you say, most people would probably say, why the hell didn't you, didn't you just do it? You? <laughs> Why would you Why want to listen to this trade? It? No, I, I know your reasons, and I want you to tell everyone th yeah. this, this impacted the lives it, of it so did. many and people. It, it does, like and I think that is the real world issue on the side of this. You know, we always got to remember there's another side to this illegal price rigging, which is done in the paper market, hurts nobody who's playing that game in the paper market other than uh, the, I mean, no, it doesn't hurt the insiders who are running that game. Now this is, but it, we've got to think that there's two sides to every trade. There's a winner, there's a loser. It's a finite equation. Now the losers are the real everyday people, which also in, which is where my heart, goes out is the producers, but more importantly, the poor individuals who pull this actual metal out of the ground, who are denied a fair price for their goods. Now, I mean, we're talking about no clean water, we're talking about cholera, we're talking about terrible conditions, but never getting a fair price. And, and I think so that was just one place I'm coming from. But in fact, during one of the most serious collusions, and this is even more prominent than the one I just described to you in 2011, that occurred in 2008, when the price of silver was surgically rived lower from $21 to just $8.50 in about three months. Now, bottom line, this forced many mines to shutter their, 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 their entire production, putting really proud people with no social support systems out of work. And you can imagine what this has what what this has done? I mean, we're talking about in this, and I think if you go to the history of, to the secret world of gold, I think that it, it could well be. I think that part may or actually be on there too, where in Bolivia we saw all these mines being shuttered, proud people who for generations had done nothing but mine silver, and have no job, uh, and in one instance uh, we we they reported a suicide, and and I think. You know, that these are the kind of things that, that we, we, we soon forget. And when there's a paper game 
on the market and whether it's corn, but we talk about precious metals because that's really where, where, where our center of focus is, but it could be anything. And, you, and I know people who've been put out of biz, uh, work, uh, put out of business um, in the coffee business. And I, I mean, over the years, this paper game has hurt a lot of people. And uh, it's not just the guys who, who, are, who are pressing the mouse that's doing this. Now, now, if this price decline that we just talked about, if that was a real a, I mean, a supply demand, a real supply demand um, situation, uh, well, so be it. I mean, then but you better find something that is more appropriate to work with. No, but, but it is not, and nor are the many other cases we've recorded since. And so just to add a bit more color, and as I say, to validate what I'm saying, please go to this, uh, to, to listen to what ex-Commissioner Bart Chilton from the CFTC said on the History Channel. Also have a look at perhaps some of, some of the items, I'm, the, the, the situations I'm talking about. But what, what blows me away, Michelle, it's taken what, 10 years, <laughs> but now we have some of the first fallout of spoofing and wire fraud charges being filed by the DOJ against some of the very same people that we are in fact sitting on the fixes during this exact same time period. And, and these are the people we provided evidence. I mean, the evidence was compelling. It was, it was impossible to deny. And why would they, why has it taken 10 years when you have everything you require to see that these, these were the people who were actually committing these collusive wire fraud ca uh, charges. And, and this is the kind of, these are the kind of charges where, you know, uh, Capone and, and people who are never, never caught, never, never could be pinned on anything. They couldn't be pinned for murder, but they were pinned on wire fraud charges. So blows me away, Michelle. Um, so, but I know, I know that more charges are coming and I think this is going to change the industry. So, and I think you can, it's going to be very, very positive for the industry. Now, Obviously, being authorized to fix a price um, uh, amongst a small group of primary market making bully banks inside a multi trillion dollar market leads right up the management chain. This is not done by somebody down in the weeds, this is done by somebody at a board level. So, I'm not sure how far up the chain the DOJ will explore. But I have my reservations that any directors or CEOs are going to join. Other managers now being jailed. I, I just can't see it. And I think, you know, I think the DOJ made it pretty clear after my lawyers and I presented a, a compelling PowerPoint presentation to their DC in their DC offices in 2011, and and it was clear that they were quite disturbed about this. But it became clear also they were going to have to box clever you know, just by the things that they were saying, and and despite. Absolute clear evidence. I'm not talking about just spoofing, which a lot of these cases are about spoofing, where you, you pull a bid, you, 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 you cancel it. What, that spoofing is just one tool in the toolbox which enables you to achieve a price point where you have all colluded to then suddenly buy back and, and, uh, or, or to sell, it, sell into. Now, I mean, many of these charges revolve around just this spoofing case, but we, are, we, we, we know that there's bigger wire fraud charges coming. And I realize, I think that's why we've had the, the DOJ has put this thing on hold uh, on for three separate, uh, uh, I think three separate six month periods. Um, but I think it's starting to come out now. And I think what really, when I really realized what, what, that it wasn't going to be an easy, uh, you, you know, you think, look, here, regulator, here's police, here, Mr. Policeman, here it is, go arrest them. Um, well, <laughs> I realized when they posed me a rhetorical question, it was, what about the economic consequences of this, Andrew? Well, who cares? I mean, sorry, but, you know, put these guys in jail. Um, but really, this was the point where my actual journey, walking out of there, so where my journey really started, where to try and figure a way of addressing the paper to physical market balance, um, there was a, there's a way of doing it. This COMEX market is a joke. Um, it is prime, it's an undeliverable, it's been an undeliverable market. That's actually changing at the moment. But uh, a great deal of our work 
has now become public on 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 how we're achieving this and and it was there's no such thing as a coincidence but when i walked out of the doj office in 2011 i think it was in within one or two months i met the gentleman thomas coglan who had just come up with a genius concept of creating a, a fully institutional grade allocated the allocated bullion exchange which was launched at that time and or was being being conceived at that time and was being launched and I, I could not believe the answer was there in front of us look if we create hubs all over the world and they're all f- full of physical gold and nothing can be sold or bought unless that physical gold was in there and because they are global and they're all fungible and you can exchange those prices amongst different locations all over the globe then what you've done is flatten the price you've created an arbitraged real physical gold price not one that is set in the paper market but real what is the real physical price and we we for example there were so many games going on at that time and you know for example the bank of china um in and that t- in those days the kilo market was even smaller than it is now um uh, uh, it was very small and so someone like the bank of china wanted to come in and buy and buy and sell kilo bars well jp morgan or the other big guys market making banks they say i know who that is and so really by creating the allocated bullion exchange you created really a way of trading that would actually um take they wouldn't be able to see the book of who was trading and i think this was a really a brilliant thing and i think that has now evolved into i think that was a st- stage 1 but really ultimately our goal was always to bring that physical price um to to the mainstream and 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 maybe we'll talk about kinesis perhaps in in a little while but i think it, it's just really trying to tell you look there was a, an it's amazing how this solution just fell and i don't believe it was a coincidence meeting uh, meeting tom um so more recently uh, giving the given the doj charges likely evolve into multi billion if not trillion dollar fines and worse for the banks and the doj may contain it to billions and what's that i mean so what 50 billion 100 billion what's that how many days trading profit is that right. for the average bank it's 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 a joke however you can't stop the class action suits and there's going to be every lawyer worth his salt is going to say hold on a minute DOJ just called JP Morgan on uh, on the on the tw- I think the 31st of uh, of of July a criminal organization held on a minute now you've got this criminal organization sort of um uh, trading on the market still it's still acting as acting as a market maker but the point is is that you know you know very well that um you could now put a class together and very very quickly oh that's a l- lot yeah. of people they'll just come in and okay look we all know the lawyers get rich doing that kind of stuff but i think if you've got normally you probably get a few cents on the buck um <laughs> well, it depends on what your trading was and uh, over a 10 year period to have already been alerted to it by you and to know it continued is extraordinary yes. i just want to nutshell something just to put a spotlight on what you said you brought it and said hey watch this the next 24 hours it's already yeah. planned here it is boom i just want to make sure everyone including myself understands what's happening and again with one silver trade you said how many billions of dollars was made uh, the the multi billions i mean you I, you have to look at the heat secret road goal because it gives the exact number and to be honest i can't remember because we we become glazed over with all of these things over time but i mean it's on there it's on the secret road goal and i think the exact each tick we walk through each and every step of that 6 dollar move down and how exactly how everyone started to buy at exactly the same when i say everyone inside us knew exactly when to buy back and and i think when you when you actually have this this data uh when you share this this is the kind of data when you've shared that data and you know it's going and i'm and 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 michelle we're talking about in many cases to the exact dollar and cent price before it bounced i mean we're not talking about a you know oh within a few bucks no we're talking about the exact dollar and cent because so so essentially if you knew it was going to go down to a certain level 
the next day, well, you could, if the price was rising, you could short with impunity. You knew that anything you short sold on the way up, you were going to make even more profit on the way down. But you, more importantly, you knew exactly where to cover it. And then there would be a big competition with everyone to cover. And then you'd see a spike up, hence the spikes. And, um, uh, and that, yeah. So, yeah, 20, 28 examples of when it was going to, um, where it was going to fix the, in, the, in the global gold market, uh, where a thousand tons of gold get cleared every day, but only three to five tons of physical gold actually transact. So you can see how this game kind of works, really. It's, it's so dilutive. I just, I, I had to recap that one because that's extreme. Was it 28 counts or 88 times? 88. 88. 88. Because 88, 88 trades in the next 24 hours already yeah. with all these traders ready to go, billions and billions being made. It's just, it's mind blowing. It really is. Um, and, you know, honestly, the fact that you were the single person to go to the United States regulators, it's not just about money and what they can take to you, um, let's, let's be honest, it's about your life. It's about being, putting yourself in actual um, jeopardy. Because when we're talking about that kind of money, um, people have disappeared over a lot less, Andrew. And that's why I say your, your life honestly reads like a James Bond movie that is yet to be made because this is extraordinary. I want to shift to the Comex. You mentioned something here about it. And then, of course, I want to cover Kinesis for everyone because I want the whole audience to understand what you're doing and what they have the opportunity to participate in right now. But Comex, deliveries, what's happening, Andrew, right now? Okay, well, the good thing is I know you've got loads of good guests that will tell you um, really good information about the Comex, but I'm going to give you the wholesale, the wholesaler and vaulting provider's view, which, which really is um, very, probably a little bit different in some respects and because we really are down in the weeds. We know exactly who's doing what. And when we see an order come through, we all already know who it is, but um, we, don't, we, we, don't need, uh, we don't even need to be told where it, we might not know where the price is going exactly, but we sure as hell know who's behind it now. But look, I, I'm summarizing here. And there's a lot more nuances to this. I mean, and obviously, this is a quite a detailed subject. But in summary, on March the 23rd, the Comex market broke. Now, what broke was the paper to physical exchange for physical mechanism. And again, wind back to what we were talking about in the DOJ. One day, this thing is going to blow up anyway. So, and, and this is another thing we said to them, it's going to blow up. The physical market will overrun the paper market at some point. And you need to be on the right side of this. And, uh, or, or, or the, the taxpayer funded banks better be on the right side of this because how are you going to go back to the people and say, look, we've got to bail these guys out again. Uh, and by the way, we did actually go into the UK parliament and get it read in parliament last year. And I met with Andrew Bailey, the, uh, Andrew Bailey, the now governor of the Bank of England, while he was head of the FCA and told him, better watch out, guys, because these, these class action suits are coming and you're going to go with your hand out to the, to the people. You, no government is actually going to uh, allow uh, another bailout of all the banks, which we saw and, uh, in 2008. But essentially what happened on March 23rd was the paper market broke. And, and it was this paper to physical exchange. Um, now, a lot of people perhaps don't know the detail of it, but what we call it is the, the EFPs, the Exchange for Physical Mechanism. So in summary, so in the 10 times larger over-the-counter market, uh, which is outside of the COMEX, which, is, uh, which are viewed as the delivery markets, because this is a, this can be, you can take one of those positions and actually demand delivery on a T plus two, a two, a two day delivery basis, whether you get it or not, that's another question. But anyway, um, but uh, this is where the gold and silver prices fixes are set in this market. So, so it, they generally run a large, a largely long spot gold and silver book, but not all of this is one-to-one -one physical, and that's the key. And what we're really discussing here is really a 100-to-1 fractionally physically backed long gold contract. And it could be to hedge a position uh, for their clients, or it's largely the case taking, scooping a small arbitrage profit onto the COMEX. Now, the resulting technical 
um, can tango, and, and I don't want to get too technical, but the bottom line, I think most people understand what the, you know, the difference between con tango and, and backwardation. But this can technical contango between Loco London and Spot, which is the spot price, and the CME futures was not what it appeared to me. And information out of London on that day pointed to an anchor liquidity provider. And I'm talking about someone of such size uh, that they were quite happy to provide liquidity into a 15 trillion a year market suddenly pulling out of the market-making functions in the over-the-counter gold market. That's immediately spooked all other liquidity providers. Hence, you look at that chart, what you see there is what happened right there. And as a result, no market makers were willing to step in and make markets in this 15 trillion a year over-the-counter market. So, and and this, this breakdown was instigated by a massive short squeeze in futures, and that exposed hundreds of tons of underwater gold spot positions, which were being demanded for delivery. Now, in this lead up to this event, and just as we're seeing again now, which is why I'm talking about it, we evidence massive tonnage size spot index buying. Uh, and these spot index positions would be tendered for delivery. And a spot index price is really all that is, is me saying, look, I'm just locking in. I can see a price in the spot market, over the counter market, it's X. I'm buying, I'll buy X amount of uh, ounces, tons, whatever it might be at that price. Now, it doesn't matter to me then if I say pick a price of 1950 and uh, by the time I get delivery, it's moved up to 2000 or more. I don't care. I, I own those ounces at 1950. So it I, I, doesn't matter to me. Um, so, so that's what spot indexes in, is really, and, and, and a lot of the wholesale industry does that simply to try and lock in prices. Um, so suddenly, these spot index positions that are largely, and I say there's a thousand tons of gold cleared in the London market for every three to five tons of delivered. Suddenly, people wanted delivery, and 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 basically, um, that's what blew it up. No one wanted to, to, provide, uh, to provide delivery when they were really just looking to make an arbitrage trade on a very fractional based contract. And I think suddenly, so suddenly the, the worst thing that can happen to you if you, are a, if you are a liquidity provider and you suddenly, oh, you've suddenly provided uh, bullion, uh, you've bought spot and you've hedged it in futures and suddenly everyone says, no, no, I'd rather take, I just right. want to. Hey, we want our, we want our physical, yeah. this is something that, is this something new and different to them, right? They had not really been doing business in that way. So now the COMEX is looking at, just in layman terms, the COMEX is looking at a very si different situation. They were dealing with paper, 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 and now all of a sudden all their customers are saying, no, we want our physical gold and silver. Do they have it? And clearly they didn't because then we saw a $100 spread between <laughs> per ounce between uh, what we normally in the EFPs, we get a $2 spread. Maybe, you know, you, you buy one side, you sell the other, you've got a $2 spread and you can, you can, you can make a decent arbitrage pocket over time. But suddenly, you know, just to, just to, just to get by, to square your spot position so that somebody, you didn't have to deliver it to someone, you'd have, it cost you a hundred bucks more per ounce at one point. And then it moved down to 80 and slowly, but it took about a week to settle down. But a lot of people got burnt really badly. And I'm talking about second tier uh, European bullion banks who are still suffering from that today and really no longer wanted to trust uh, this, this, this conduit, this, this interaction between the spot market and the, and the, uh, and the future. So, Andrew, so for anyone who's not familiar with this market, tell us what COMEX is. We know it's the Commodities Exchange. Um, what arm governs precious metals and what was doing this? Because commodities can be anything, corn, whatever. Um, just give a, a brief nutshell of what we're talking about when we talk about the COMEX was a paper trader who all of a sudden didn't have the gold when people said, hey, we want our metal. Yeah, and I think the COMEX market was, look, the COMEX market was, um, it came into being about two years after um, Nixon took um, gold off the, uh, the dollar peg. And, and really at that point there, uh, COMEX was instigated really to bring, uh, and then there was plenty of admissions about this. Look, 
we need to control this, the gold market. If we can't do it um, in, the, in the physical market anymore, let's do it in the paper market. So what we'll do is create a paper market that is undeliverable, essentially, and uh, we will throw so much liquidity in there. We will swamp so many, uh, so much supply in there that is not deliverable that we can actually control the price. Because up until then, Nixon found that, of course, people were saying, look, <laughs> you can raise the price. I'll take it. Thank you very much. And I want delivery of it. And then suddenly you saw the gold reserves disappearing. And so they had to slam that door shut and create another way to control gold. Because after all, gold is, let's face it, it is the other side of a currency trade. You are long gold, you're short the dollar. It's the anti-dollar. So you're long the dollar, you're short gold. I mean, same with silver. So really you can understand how, why you'd want some mechanism to control. Uh, and also the other thing I will, I will bring to mind is, is that it also creates volatility. And, and by creating volatility, what you do is you put a lot of people off. Even though gold is the best performing asset since, since 2000 versus anything, um, people still look at it and say, oh, it's, it's, but it's so volatile. That's the first thing I hear. No, it's not. Actually, if you draw away from a 10-minute chart and you look at the big picture, this is a 5,000-year-old currency. Now, what, what, how long has the dollar been around? How long has the pound's been around? I mean, fiat currencies last, what, 40, maybe 50 years? You know, so, you know, so, so essentially the COMEX is there to control the gold price, to, to dilute the gold price. But then people woke up and said, well, hold on a minute. If I can get gold there at a, a low price, then I'll just take, thank you, I'll have it. Thank you very much. So, and then, but really the COMEX wasn't the place you would actually get it because, because that price synced exactly with the over-the-counter spot price. So they would sync exactly bar for maybe a little bit of carry cost. Um, and I think this is what blew up. Uh, suddenly everyone said, well, hold on, no, 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 no. We, we, we will actually take the physical thank you very much. So they lost control. And I think this is why we're saying the COMEX blew up. It blew up on that day. And, um, and if we fast forward to now, what we're seeing is a mad scramble because in 1974, you, you created this market and, and you got control. Now we look, that control lost on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the 23rd of March. Now, so we've witnessed a mad scramble to add back liquidity into the COMEX. It's a desperate, scurry deals with, the, with their competitors, with the LBMA, which is a competitor really. Um, and, and these guys have lots to lose. The reason they got together is- And I wanted just, to you know, just so you know, and everybody understands, I wanted um, our audience members to understand what the COMEX is because it's always been, it's like the king, everybody looks to the COMEX in the metals markets and they've done so ever since it was created. It's like the regulatory system or, or the, you know, it's the king of information when it comes to the markets. You always reference the COMEX, reference the COMEX, and everybody's heard of that. But um, what you're explaining is it was created to manipulate the metals, keep everyone from getting the metals, be a paper market that just sort of reflected what was going on. It was basically trading nothing, paper, right? Yep. If they didn't have the gold and they didn't have the silver, this king of the stats – actually was just what <laughs> yeah and 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 we see we still see i mean obviously you know when, when you're talking about you know you're talking about uh, central banks here and and they intervene intervene interfere same word they intervene in all the currency crosses whether it be the the the, the yen or the euro or whatever and, and sometimes they agree to do these things but a little old gold and a little old silver these are big, big, well, gold is a big, big market. And, and so essentially what you're doing is you're, you, you want to try and control that along with all the other foreign exchange prices. So people look at the COMEX and don't realize, they look at it as, a, as you say, as a commodity, which gold is not a commodity. It is, it's crazy to even think of it as a commodity. This is money. It is, that's why only gold and silver and well, you have platinum and palladium, but let's look at gold. So only gold and silver of all of the commodities out there trade as a foreign exchange cross in the 10 times larger foreign exchange market in London, which is what these COMEX uh, traders were banned from doing uh, a few years back. So and we explained, 
So you, know, you can sort of start to put a few of these pieces together and see, look, they're doing everything they can to rig this thing so that and contain and silo everyone to, to continue to, to, to not exit this casino. But there is an exit and the exit is physical gold physical silver and and obviously you're not now tra talking about trading on margin you're not talking about borrowing money from a market making bullion mac who who sees exactly how much physical exposure you have and how much how much monetary pain you can take and look at the book and target aggregate those 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 positions and target them and we see this all the time. You know, so it's crazy. These are when you think about it. These are people that didn't own anything. They didn't own the the gold. They didn't own the silver. But they're making billions and billions of dollars trading the metals market. And the people that own the gold and the silver are the ones that are suffering through it. And that's what's extraordinary. The owners of that commodity are really being ripped off. Why the people that don't own anything except paper are saying, "Hey, you know, trade me." And they made extraordinary amounts of money. I want to go into physical. I want to go into your price forecasts. What are you seeing now that things are starting to shift? Where do you think we're going to go with gold and silver prices, Andrew? Um, well, I think we're going to go, well, clearly we're going to go a lot higher. I think um, what we're talking about here is the end game. Um, I think, yes, we're seeing this sudden scramble to try and provide liquidity back into the COMEX. But the, the oddest thing has happened uh, because um, because the COMEX lost so much credibility, uh, because they risked losing uh, this still, uh, th this was a center. This has been, uh, this was put into place in 1974 as a hub. And yes, it's a paper market. Only less than one, 0.1% or maybe 0.2% has ever been delivered out of the COMEX up until March. All of a sudden, these guys realized, oh God, um, We've got none, nobody wants to use this facility anymore. They don't trust it anymore. It clearly broke. Um, well, maybe what we should do is bring in physical gold and physical silver. And the irony of it is, is the COMEX is now trying to become a physical market, and which is something they were never set up to do. Now, obviously there's a lot of layers to this because that doesn't mean to say you can't have position concentration. Uh, I mean, you, you can be, you can be, um, you can hold the physical and on in one market and you can come into the paper market and you can create so much of a centric position that is so big that you can actually still move things around. But where they've shot themselves in the foot, and this is really interesting because this is change, a changing dynamic, is that now as a wholesaler, look, I have to wait. I have to wait for silver, wholesale silver bars. I can't get them. Um, well, I don't say I can't get them. I can't get enough of them to fill my to, to fill my orders. Nor can any of the people that I that I that I know. And so what we're doing is we're rationed to what we can get. So now, we, in fact. Silver is in such a tight supply that we are actually for wholesale bars, thousand ounce bars, we're having to wait till January, February and March for delivery. Well, this is crazy. You know, if a bullion bank is sitting there with, with bullion in their inventory, in their, why would they not sell it to you? Well, they, <laughs> they don't sell it to you because they don't want to sell it to you at this price. And, and so, you know, this is this, this is really one of the situations we're now seeing. Well, okay, if we can't get it in Switzerland and we can't get it in London, and no one wants to sell it, hold on a minute. Uh, there's a, there's a price in the Comex, and look, there's they claim there's registered inventory there. So thank you very much. We will take it. So now we're seeing people coming to the to, to the Comex to buy what they have bought and bring it back. And I think this is an interesting situation because- You mean physically? I've seen this. Andrew, do you mean they physically travel to the COMEX to say- Yeah, yeah. Give all, us all the silver bars, all the silver bars out of uh, Switzerland up until I think this last month, every single thousand ounce bar has gone to the States. Um, and I kind of got a bit of a story about that as well because there, there's good old, um, uh, JP Morgan is now um, somehow cornered that market. But, it, but I think in general terms, what we're saying is the COMEX has now become, it's kind of shot itself in the foot because if I can't get gold or I can't get silver, 
I don't care if I have to play a pain ride and a plane ride has cost me what two bucks an ounce to bring it back. It, it doesn't bother me. You know, the point is at least I can get it because my clients are saying, get me physical, get me physical gold, get me physical silver. And I'm saying, sorry, but you're going to have to wait for it. So I will go and spot a bite on the spot market and I'll wait T plus 120 if I have to, to get this, but they're going to have to wait for it. And that's ludicrous because there's supposed to be so much silver in the COMEX. And I think this is only just beginning to evolve that people are realizing, look, let's just raid it then. Let's go and get it. And, and I think this is an interesting dynamic. When you say raid the COMEX, what are you speaking of? What do you mean? Uh, what I'm saying is, is that because it, it, it is deemed to be an undelivery market and I am unable and they have somehow cornered all the physical gold and silver to be brought into this insider run casino, then I, if I can't get the gold and silver in the, in the size I, I want locally in, the, in Europe or in the, in the traditional sources out of London, and it sits in the COMEX, then I will come to the COMEX and I will not just buy it for, for trading, I'll buy it to take physical delivery from the COMEX and I will put it on a plane and I will take it to where it's needed and I'll pay the price. Exactly. You know, I want to cover Kinesis before we go. Um, this has been an amazing interview. You are always so amazing. We, we need to do a series, a five-part <laughs> series. <laughs> with I'll come back. Right. We'll come back. Not a problem. We'll, yes. we'll, we'll look at, I know there's so many other questions that we could. I, I had so many. I want to talk about the ratio between gold and silver. I, hey, let's, let's do that before we get to Kinesis, because I do want to talk about this, this ratio. This is swiftly coming together. We had 100 and 23 to one in the spring, Andrew, with a gold to silver ratio. What's happening? You know, there are some people that are predicting parity one to one. I don't know if that's going to happen, but do you think we're going to come close? Yeah, I think the what? So what is the I mean, you know, people talk six to one, four to one. I think um, historically you couldn't argue 15 or 16 to one, even if you took 16 to one. Now, most of the bullion banks that, and liquidity providers I deal with, um, they look at, they say, look, <laughs> we already see 2,500 gold. I mean, as a liquidity provider, we can't see it being less than that. In fact, we see if there's going to be a revaluation, it will be at 2,500. So, so given that that is, the, and, and we're talking about Goldman Sachs, we're talking about America, we're talking about a lot of these guys who used to be on the bearish side of gold. And they're, and they're saying, look, okay, minimum 2,500. Okay, 16 to 1. Well, what does that put? That puts silver at 150 bucks an ounce. I mean, why wouldn't it be at 150 bucks an ounce? Uh, why wouldn't it be at 200 bucks an ounce? Um, it's in short supply. Uh, yes, it's being contained or, or con contained by one or two entities, but they're not selling it because they won't sell it at this price. So it'll come to, there'll come a point where somebody will actually offer if I go to a to a whole to, to to my wholesale sources to a bullion bank and I say, look, you're showing three or four hundred tons of, of silver. Can you sell it to me? And they'll say, yeah, okay, um, great, because there will be a price that they were happy to sell it at. Right now, I go to this bank and they say, you keep bugging me, and I'm not going to I'm not going to take your next phone call. Um, and, and so really you step back and say, well, look, well, what will you give us and when will you give it to us? And, and so really there, what I'm saying is there is a price where physical will come to the market, a real supply demand price. And I think, um, so the ratio of thing for gold silver has got to be back to 16 to one at best. I think immediately I see 60, 62 to one, I think that pauses briefly, momentarily, and then it goes down to 32 or thereabouts, 32 to 1, on its way to 16 to 1, which I think we will see that by next year. And I think that raises a whole nother uh, <laughs> bunch of other issues, really, because um, essentially at, at silver then becomes so valuable. Um, this is why I, I, when I go to, to, to our Liechtenstein vaults and stuff, and I see, look, why are people buying? I say, what? 
Yeah, thousand ounce bar is great. I mean, I can, floor to ceiling. You know, I mean, people are buying. You know, literally store stocking up on silver. But there are people there, floor to ceiling, and I'm talking pallets of silver coins, just silver one ounce coins. Why? Because when it's 150 bucks an ounce or 200 bucks an ounce or whatever price, that's a fungible small amount you can trade with, or you can go to a jeweler. You can hang. No matter what happens, you will have something that's fungible and, and rather than a bar of gold, which is going to be so valuable. Um, the, even an ounce of gold is so, it's going to be so valuable. Whereas these, this is very tradable. So I think this makes a lot of sense. And I see a lot of people doing that as well. That's interesting. Now you're seeing um, silver. You wouldn't be surprised at 150 to 200 by next year. That's amazing. What are your thoughts on gold? Um, well, I think what's going to happen with gold, it has to be revalued. Look, we've got so much debt. We've got so much, I mean, what, 27 and a half trillion in US debt alone. I mean, I mean, goodness me, there, there comes a point, um, the, the markets, the banking, you know, the, the banking system's broken. Um, I think $2,500 gold is pretty much the consensus level where most of the people in the know, and I'm talking about, I have friends at some of the very biggest institutions and they reckon that a $2,500 gold, what's going to happen is it's, it's going to be the point where the reset happens. And, and I think you have to revalue gold. Um, you know, you've got that much debt. If you were to, if you were to trying to remonetize gold in, into a global currency, it's not going to work at $2,500. It, it's going to have to work at $10,000 or some other price that isn't $2,500 gold. And I think what's going to happen is it will happen in the foreign exchange markets. There'll be on a Friday night, it'll come in at probably 2,390 or something. And then on, on the Monday morning, there'll be a freeze. Uh, everyone who has unallocated gold, people who don't have the physical gold will be settled for cash because that's part of the contract. You can settle for cash. And the price will then go to where there's an offer to sell. And that's offer to sell price will be God knows where. Michelle, I cannot tell you what that price will be. It, it would just be pure speculation. I can see where silver would be at 2,500. That makes sense. But where will it be uh, once it's revalued when you start dividing this debt into this, into this limited stack of gold that you have? What, 8,500 tons of gold in the US? How, is that rehypothecated? How many, it may physically be there. People say, well, it, I know it's there. Well, or it may not be there, but even if it's there, how many ownership claims are on there? I mean, you know, when, when, Deutsche, when, when uh, the German bank tried to repatriate just 300 tons of gold, they said, oh, it'll take seven years. Excuse me, Michelle, I can put 20 tons of, of, pla of, of gold on a plane. I, I could have done that in two weeks. Why is it going to take seven years to get my 300 tons of gold back out? You know, these are ludicrous situations. And then it raises red flags and you say, well, hang on a minute. There's something wrong, <laughs> something wrong about this picture somewhere. So, so I would say perhaps that 8,500 tons is not 100%. There may be more than one ownership claim on it. And because a lot of this is leased, but still sits in the vault, there's just a but it's those lease positions that will probably get settled for cash. This market has so many nuances. You know how you have the, the premiums that are, are, I don't know, $2. Oh, no, they're $100 if you want it delivered. You know, you have supposedly the gold of our country. Supposedly it exists, and yet no one's audited it. And yet there's least positions upon it. And then we have all of the manipulation and the fraud, which you reported um, now 10 years ago, just now being looked at. Maybe it took them that long to really investigate the situation. I don't know. But that's extraordinary when you can name 88 samples over the next 24 hours of you can say what that trade's going to be and watch everybody trade. It seems to me they would have gone in with a raid at that moment in time. You know, you wouldn't have to crash the market. But certainly those people were um, committing massive fraud. I mean, this is just this, this whole picture. This is about the most interesting picture. Well, I'm not going to say the most interesting picture right now because across the globe we have all these, you know, 
unbelievable situations, but mm. this is an extraordinary, when you really step back and understand what's happened with gold and silver, Andrew. Yeah, it's, it's mind blowing really. And you think about it, it is, it's the anti-dollar. It's the, it's, it's the um, anti-fiat system. It's, it's your safe haven. It's, it's your, it's your only place where else, what else can you do? I mean, other than look for something that you can see, touch and smell something real, uh, gold, silver, um, you know, it, it can be mines, it can be forests, it can be anything tangible. But gold and silver, let's face it, are the most fungible. You can swap a piece of gold, a tiny piece of gold uh, in this country with somebody in, in, in Timbuktu. It, it doesn't matter where, it's still the same value. It is seen as the same value. And for 5,000 years, it's always bought a similar value. Uh, you can't debase it. Um, and and uh, so really, uh, I think that kind of like, this is why I became so interested in, in the Kinesis story is because um, I mentioned the Allocated Bullying Exchange creating this, this uh, where, where Tom really and, and the team and, and myself was involved, um, created this, uh, this global hub of physical physical price determined prices where if you you can't go there and say i want a thousand tons of silver if there isn't a thousand tons of silver there someone has to first put this thousand tons of silver there before it can be traded so but i think i think one of the most interesting things is to bring in this 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 monetary system which which we we always planned um, but, but I think it took the blockchain to really, really uh, bring, create that mechanism. And, and I think, so generally speaking, I think no matter, everyone understands the digital gold now, we see what, 60, 70 gold coins out there. I mean, it's so good to, to, to see, uh, you know, other, other people t t create digitizing gold. Um, and obviously you've got to be so careful who you're dealing with in this instance, but Digital gold's going mainstream. And I think, so really, um, we're encountering a move by people all over the world to exchange their debasing fiat currencies for gold as much as they can. I know people who put, you know, 10%. I also know people who put 95% of, of, their, of all their cash into gold and then, and, and then have the option of really churning that into fiat when they need it. But, I mean, it's the gold's always been the best option to preserve your wealth from any debasement. What you've created with Kinesis, you and Tom and your team, is amazing. And um, it's, it's specifically for this time, I think. What is Kinesis, for anyone that hasn't heard of it, what is it specifically and what do you offer? Because you have now have debit cards, don't you? This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is an entire monetary ecosystem. And, and I think um, it enables one to, it enables us to, digitize gold, put it on the blockchain. But the important thing is that it is securely stored outside the banking system. And, and really, because you've got to watch that, you've got to avoid counterparty risks um, of this broken banking system. Now, there is a huge amount of risk out there uh, on bail-ins and one thing and another. So, you know, there's no reason why they couldn't extend that to uh, if you hold your, your physical gold in your local bank vault. Uh, we saw it in Cyprus. We saw it in Greece. Uh, we, they, they will just, there'll be somebody who will turn up and say, look, I need to have the other key here and I'm going to see what you've got. And, and, and it's possible that they, that comes, becomes part of your bail-in. So, so Kinesis really, um, make, what we do is we store all this, all the bullion is one-to-one. -one. Each, each gram of gold, each ounce of silver is one-to-one -one directly titled to the person who is using it they own it, they can take delivery of it, but they, can, but they can spend it and trade it. And when they spend it and trade it, what they're doing is they're actually getting a share of the entire monetary ecosystem. So as it travels through the system, it generates revenue. It goes to one person, uh, you pay your utility bill with it. And you go, oh, okay, if I paid my utility bill with cash, it's gone. I pay my utility bill with Kinesis, now I've just generated and it, a, 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 well, essentially a yield. Um, 
because that as that moves on around the system, it continues to generate yield f- for life. So essentially, I create. I'm creating. I'm minting. I'm creating currency, and 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 it, it lives in the system until somebody actually says, you know, I'll I'll take that and I'll take physical delivery of it. So, so really, I think what we're saying is is that Kinesis provides all the security required to trust your gold is always titled and accessible to you personally, but it enables you to exchange your gold currency for any other currency. And you can go to any bank machine anywhere, pretty much anywhere in the world and take, use that, use that card, debit card to take out the currency of that country. Um, now, obviously, <laughs> so it's, it's instantly fungible. Um, and you can convert your gold back to physical or, 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 or bullion into cash in an instant. And, and unlike any other e-payment gold offering, uh, Kinesis enables you to become your own central bank. So you have to take ownership. We should take ownership. Yes. Let's be our own central bank by owning physical gold. But, but again, you can't just take a lump of gold and walk down to the shop and buy a Starbucks with it. You need to trust. Look, this is on the trustless blockchain. Um, if we described really essentially how we are, we're going to escape a broken banking system by using gold and, and sidestep all these depreciating fiat currencies. But unlike any other gold e-market payment offering, what we're doing is in asking you, becoming, you're becoming an integral, integral part of this ecosystem and it's because you're sharing in the transaction fees, but you're becoming a part of the solution. What we're doing each time you spend, we're buying physical gold. We're taking physical gold and putting it in the vault. This is, involves billions of dollars. And you know what? We have so many endorsements. Now we have, for example, uh, a joint venture with the Indonesian um, exchange, uh, with the Indonesian government, I'm sorry. And, and they've adopted Kinesis as part of their system because they say, well, look, you know, this is perfect. Uh, we, 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 in fact, we want each one of our 300 million people to have a banking system. Um, a lot of these guys are unbanked. In fact, I'd say 60% of them are either underbanked or unbanked. And suddenly you've got a mobile phone, you can put your Kinesis currency on there. It's physical, you can spend it, you can share it, you can store it. And, and to me, it's just the perfect solution. And I think I, I would just say to people, look, go on the Kinesis website and have a look. This is the physical solution that, that I envisaged in 2011, that Tom envisaged in 2011. It's here for us all. It costs you nothing. You just use the money and, and, and you will and own the gold and you'll earn a fee from using it. And I think... That's all I would say. Listening to you and the power that you took in your life and the things that you've done just because they're right and to know that you're um, working with Tom on Kinesis and that it's an entire monetary system, I think it's very important for everyone to realize what's actually happening behind the scenes. Andrew, this has been an amazing interview. You're always amazing every time you come here. Please tell everyone how they can follow your work and also please repeat the Kinesis website one more time. Yeah, and, and you can really follow everything we're doing on the kinesis.money website. Uh, you can find it very easily, and there's everything on there about uh, all the latest news, our Indonesian developments, uh, our, our integrations into various other governments. And, uh, and this, is, this is really a big story. And uh, I think now, I think, uh, have a look, go, go to the minting section where you can actually uh, cr- cr- become your own central bank. You could do it by next week. You could be your own central bank. You could take full, utter, complete control of your finances and, uh, and get it out of the system. You'll breathe a lot easier. Andrew, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Michelle, it's been such a blast. Really look forward to coming back, and we've got so much more to talk about. Yes, indeed. Mr. Andrew McGuire, precious metals expert, whistleblower, and director at Kinesis.Money. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.